Blighted maps are still insane. I know you've probably heard by now about how blighted maps are basically currency printers and if you aren't doing blighted maps you're losing out on money, but you, like many others, may feel too intimidated to begin running blighted maps due to worries that you won't be able to pull it off after getting slapped up when you encounter them in maps. Do not let them reach the purification pump! Well, I'm here to tell you that you too can run any blighted maps you want with just making a few slight changes to the way that you roll the maps plus how you actually build your defense. Remember. If this guide helped you out, make sure to like this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. It lets me know what kind of videos you want to see more of in the future. Also, you can find me live on Twitch in the evenings at twitch.tv slash bigducks. So if you want to see examples of high-end content like blighted maps, you can find links to my Twitch as well as my Discord server and Twitter in the description below this video. Now if you aren't sure what blight actually is, I'll give an explanation of the basics. However, if you want to jump to any specific section of the video, there are timestamps available for each section in the description down below. Blight League was Path of Exile's first foray into a different style of League mechanic. Instead of the gameplay being focused around the act of playing your character, you had another task at hand, of strategizing and building tower combinations that allowed you to overcome wave upon wave of monsters, and numerous powerful bosses. Blight League wasn't exactly my favorite League of all time, but that was mostly because of the lack of the actual blighted maps themselves dropping, as well as numerous balancing issues that plagued the initial release. With the introduction of Blight as a basic map mechanic, they've solved most of the problems that shipped with the Blight League itself, including the amount of blighted maps that drop, as well as some of the bugs that left people with not a so stellar opinion of the mechanic. Your introduction to the blight mechanic will most likely begin with entering a map and suddenly hearing someone humming or singing about burning the unrighteous. Righteous, what to this is Cassia, a Templar whose goal is to contain the spread of blight throughout Rayclass, and to remind you of how unintelligent and unreliable you are. So if you're not into being talked down you to... Won't. The blight mechanic itself begins when you click on the giant blight spore. Pathways will extend from the base in all directions. These are the pathways that the monsters will travel towards the blight pump, and our job is to stop them dead in their tracks. You'll also notice small towers spread along these areas that have a circular indicator above them. These are the towers that you'll use for your defense. After attempting to build a tower, you'll notice the same icons at the bottom of your screen. This section is the list of enemy portals that will spawn and which towers they will be resistant to. Being resistant means that the towers will do less damage to these minions and they will be immune to all secondary effects. Keep in mind that the tier 4 towers are their own tower types and they are exempt from the immunities listed of the lower level towers. The event will progress from left to right so plan your defenses accordingly. Upon successful destruction of the blight, a giant loot explosion of mostly useless items will happen and you'll notice chests with varying icons above them at each of the successfully thwarted portals. This is where the money is hiding. Now, let's talk about each individual tower, and their strengths, weaknesses, and my personal suggestions on their use. A quick note about towers before we begin. Many of the tier 3 towers are far more important than their tier 4 counterparts. Towers such as the Chilling, Seismic, and Empowering Towers are extremely strong at their tier 3, and then far weaker upon upgrade. There are six tower types, each with four tiers and two upgrade paths at the final tier. In no particular order, the towers are the Chilling Tower. This tower deals low damage and applies the chill ailment to nearby enemies, and is useful for slowing the progress of blighted monsters around the map. At rank 4, it upgrades into either the Glacial Cage Tower, which summons a frost wall ring that imprisons enemies. This can be useful for stopping blight bosses if you're having difficulty getting them down in time, but is mostly ineffective due to some targeting issues. Or the Freeze Bolt Tower, which will shoot piercing projectiles that freeze enemies. This tower suffers from slow rate of attack, and the fact that the projectiles are so razor thin makes the targeting extremely spotty. My suggestion is to spread these behind your main damage towers at level 1 or 2 and don't upgrade them to level 4 unless you're absolutely struggling with bosses, and then you can consider making a single glacial cage tower for them near the pump. The Shock Nova Tower this tower deals low damage and applies shocked ground in a small area around it, causing enemies to take more damage while standing upon it. This tower is best suited for right in the middle of choke points where multiple lanes of enemies converge on a single spot. At rank 4, it upgrades into either the Lightning Storm Tower, which deals high damage and randomly strikes enemies at medium range. This tower is fine, but unfortunately it pales in comparison in almost every way to our other option here, which is the Arc Tower. This tower deals medium damage and chains between many enemies at once. This tower is the preferred option, and most likely one of the strongest towers in the game. My suggestion is to build these towers at choke points and heavily consider choosing the Arc Tower as your main DPS tower. Ignore the Lightning Storm Tower. The Empowering Tower. This tower improves the effectiveness of other towers in range and deals no damage. 
At rank 4, it upgrades into either the Imbuing Tower, which improves the effectiveness of players within its range. This tower is only useful if your build does very high levels of screen-wide damage, and you want to stand still in the middle and just AoE. This tower does not affect other towers around it like its previous versions, so only build a single one if you want to stand in it. And your other option is the Smothering Tower. This tower states that it weakens enemies in range, but there is no actual data to back this up. It's estimated that it probably does something similar to Enfeeble, or potentially makes the enemies in range take slightly more damage. This is most likely a waste of time. My suggestion is to spread tier 3 versions of the Empowering Tower evenly through your defenses. It will massively boost the effectiveness of your towers and potentially build a single imbuing tower near the pump if you intend to make a last stand in that area. The Fireball Tower. This tower deals medium damage over a very long range, but in general, the damage isn't anything to write home about. The firing pattern this tower uses makes a lot of the damage end up being ineffective. It also has a long recharge time. At rank 4, it upgrades into either the Meteor Tower, which deals very high damage at extreme range with a meteor from the sky with a slight windup. If you have issues killing bosses, this is definitely the one to build. Or the Flamethrower Tower, which has excellent clear but is slightly outperformed by the Arc Tower, so without a specific anointment, this one isn't as useful. My suggestion is is to build a meteor tower or two to handle bosses and potentially some flamethrower towers if you like them for some reason. The Seismic Tower. This is the king of crowd control. This tower is a main staple of any solid defense. It stuns enemies in a large circle around it and requires no upgrades to be useful. That's right, tier 1 of this tower is absolutely useful. At rank 4, it upgrades into either the Stone Gaze Tower, which casts a petrifying gaze similar to the Basilisk from Act 9. This is only useful if both Seismic and Chilling Towers are heavily nullified, otherwise it's too expensive for its ability. Or you can get the Temporal Tower, which has an extremely large radius and slows much stronger than any other tower in large bursts. However, this tower is expensive and is mostly useless without an anointment. My suggestion is to spread tier 1 seismic towers all throughout your defense that are supported by level 3 empowering towers. This gives them the ability to perma-stun while they are active. And finally, we have the Summoning Tower. A lot of people like this tower, and I was one of those people, but unfortunately, the more I look into it and try to make it work, the more it just disappoints me. This tower summons minions nearby to stop enemies by blocking them and doing minor damage. At rank 4, it upgrades into either the Sentinel Tower, which summons one large durable minion that does what the normal Summoning Tower does, but I guess it's slightly better, or the Scout Tower, which summons 10 untargetable flying minions that seek out enemies in a large radius. My suggestion is to honestly just completely completely ignore these towers, except for maybe a single scout tower directly near your pump to seek out incoming leaks. Now moving on to anointments, I'd like to briefly mention that you can anoint any notable large passive on the tree with a certain combination of oils that drop from the Blight Encounter chests. You'll see the required oils on the notable itself. This doesn't have anything to do with the functions of Blight, but I figured I would mention it. As for the anointments that are useful to us, there are two types. You can anoint rings to buff the various towers you have access to during a Blight Encounter. Some useful anointments are Sepia plus Azure. This gives your empowering towers 25% increased effect. This is by far the overall best anointment when you consider cost versus reward. It's very cheap and it has a very powerful effect. This is the one I recommend for most people. Golden plus Golden. All towers in range of your empowering tower have a 50% chance to deal double damage. This is by far the strongest anointment in the game, hands down, and the best choice for people dedicated to running blight maps. But the cost versus reward is terrible because you need four golden oils, which each one at the moment that I'm recording here are close to 100 chaos. So fire beware. Golden plus Teal. Your Temporal Towers also grants you 20% increased action speed. This is an enormous buff. Crimson plus Crimson. Your Meteor Towers will always stun. If you're having tons of issues with bosses, this could be useful as a one of. Silver plus Opalescent. Your Chilling Towers freeze enemies for 0.2 seconds while they are affected by the Chilling Beams. This will freeze enemies, including bosses, while under the effect of your Chilling Tower. It's very useful for slowing down packs as well. Now there are quite a few other useful anointments, but they are much more dependent upon your preferred playstyle. As for anointments on Blighted Maps themselves, there are only two worth speaking of. Teal times 3, which gives you 15% monster pack size and 6 blight chests are lucky. Or the upgrade of this, which is Crimson times 3, also gives you 15% monster pack size, but it gives you 9 blight chests that are lucky. Due to the majority of useful items being from the chests themselves, most oils are useless to us here, so getting the ones that gives us a lucky modifier on our chests is by far the best. As for builds that can run blighted maps, in general the very best builds for them are going to be ones with massive AoE or builds that chain projectiles or effects consistently. 
Summoner builds can also do blight maps well due to the minions being able to tank and stop the monsters from moving forward and auto-seeking them out in a decent radius. Keep in mind you can supplement pretty much any kind of damage that you need, whether it be AoE, single target, or just some kind of tanking to stop the minions from moving, with the actual towers that you build, so most builds will work here if you build your defenses properly. Some examples would be summoners such as the Baron, or ones focused on specters with AoE clear, or summon raging spirits. Most mine builds are good here. Some examples would be Icicle Mines or Pyroclast Mines. Builds that use abilities with built-in heavy clear mechanics such as Soul Rend or ED Contagion. And last but not least, the build that you'll see me playing during this video which is Skold's Auto Frostbolt Ice Nova. This build explodes the entire screen with tons of Frostbolts and tons of Ice Novas. Links to pay spins for Path of Building will be in the description below for a few of these builds. Blighted maps are legitimately just printing currency right now, and it's actually just mind-boggling how much you can make with so little investment, and I personally think they're pretty fun as well. Even investing 60 or more chaos into buying each map, you still come out with decent profits. A lot of the time, a lot of profits. And you don't even have to do the high tier ones, you can do the low tier ones and it works just fine. Some people are even saying that spamming low tier blighted maps is even more efficient for currency than high tier ones, but I kind of like the option of having golden or silver oils drop as well as some other high tier stuff. And the challenge is fun for me, so those are the ones that I do. Now, before you go out and you buy a single blighted map and you run it and you get no items and you feel like you've wasted your money, I need to explain something to you about life that you kind of just need to accept. To even begin to establish any kind of trend or useful data, you need three points. So when you go out and you do one of anything, it's not useful. That It could just be that you got unlucky that one time. Small sample sizes aren't indicative of anything, good or bad. So before you go out there and you run a single blighted map and you lose all the currency that you invested in it and you didn't get anything from it, and then you go down into the comments and you rage at me about how I don't know what I'm talking about and blighted maps suck, you need to be able to buy five to 10 of whatever tier of blighted map that you're going to run. So make sure you have that amount of currency that you can invest into it and lose potentially before you begin using this method. Now, with that out of the way, the steps to running the strategy are as follows. Jump onto the trade website and buy a few maps of your desired tier. I personally run 14s and 15s. Anoint your rings with some of the suggestions I made earlier, and then chisel the map up to 20% quality, and leave it white. Now, I know what you're thinking, Big Ducks, why the hell would you ever leave a tier 15 map white? Are you insane? Well, the idea here is that blighted maps when rolled heavily are insanely difficult, and the pack size and item quantity only affects the main drop that you get from the pump after completing the map. You might have noticed that most of the time, even if you roll the map extremely well, the items from that they aren't that great. Most of the good items are found in the chests. Thus, leaving the map white allows us to increase our efficiency as well as safeguarding us from running into insane map mods and potentially losing the map. So the next step is you anoint the map with three teal oils or three crimson oils if you're feeling really spicy and you pop it into the map device. Upon entering the map, the first thing you should do is take the lay of the land and look to see how the layout's going to end up. Take note of how many different paths there are leaving from where the pump spawns. To begin, I suggest building a single minion tower very close to the pump that you will upgrade to a scout tower as soon as you can. This is specifically for catching stray enemies in the early part of the fight who happen to make it through your defenses and nothing else. Don't make any more minion towers than this one. There's no reason to. They suck. Afterwards, start planning the main portion of your defense, which should consist of shock nova towers towards the front of your defenses with seismic and chilling directly near or behind them. You should also build empowering towers near enough that almost every tower is being empowered by them once they're at rank 3. As you start to generate more resources, build a few fireball towers towards the inner part of your defense. This is for any bosses that happen to move their way in later, and you'll be upgrading these to meteor towers. This is the point where you should begin upgrading your empowering towers towards rank 3 and your shock towers into arc towers. Leave your seismic and chilling towers at level 1 until you're swimming in resources, as it isn't required for them to be upgraded as long as they are in range of an empowering tower to get the full effects of their abilities. Once bosses start spawning more heavily, consider upgrading your fireball towers into meteor towers at this point. Now the reason that this strategy is effective is that just like how the main game of Path of Exile works in recent time, why would you worry about trying to use utility and skill or powerful combos and carefully laid out plans to counter specific monsters and situations when you can just kill 
killed the enemies before they have a chance to do anything. If that's fun to you, then go ahead, but it isn't going to be covered in this guide. At this point, you can make any adjustments you need for any specific circumstances that might happen, such as a mass of bosses or a specific area that is resistant to certain towers. Continue building with these guidelines in mind, and before you know it, the fight will be over. Search out any stragglers by looking on your map for any paths that are still lit up as yellow and finish them off. Upon completion of the fight, you'll see the disappointing drops from the main pump, but fear not. Move on to the chests and reap their bountiful rewards. So you're probably wondering, how is this actually going to make you consistent currency? The first and most reliable way will be from stacked decks that drop as part of the divination card chests, as well as from incubators. These are currently selling for 5 to 6 chaos each in bulk. On average in a T15 map, you can see anywhere from 5 to 10 of these stacked decks when you include incubators, sometimes more. Even with just a handful of stacked decks and the random currency that drops, you've made back your currency that you spent buying a high tier blighted map. The other consistent source of currency will come from the blighted oils. If you're running very high tier blighted maps, you'll have access to opal, silver, and golden oils, which are selling for 10, 36, and 105 chaos respectively at the moment. The other oils are still a good source of currency, but I suggest anything below teal trading up into a vendor to upgrade them to teal. This will fund your anointment of future blight maps. You can sell any excess oils you find if you aren't sustaining with the other methods. Other sources of currency in the map are scarabs, bestiary, legion, and sulfite scarabs are the ones to look out for here, raw currency, and currency shards, exalt shards are relatively common, helmet enchants, check P Ninja for popular enchants, specialty map fragments such as the Elder or Shaper pieces, and high quality or level gems. For example, I found a level 21, 23% quality Dread Banner gem that sold for close to 4 exalt on my very first day of spamming maps. There are many other sources of currency in these maps as well, but those are the most important ones. And another added bonus on top of all of this is you fill up on fragments, small types of currency that you may not have access to or don't want to trade to, and all kinds of other things. So generally, running blighted maps will increase the amount of those small currencies or fragments that you might be lacking. And that's it. It's not really complicated, and it's pretty straightforward. And with the guide that I just gave you, you should be able to do it with most builds. If you have a suggestion for a video you'd like to see in the future, let me know in the comments. Or another option would be to at me on Twitter. A last option would be joining my Discord channel, where you can get a hold of me pretty much at any time. But that's going to be it for me. Get out there and farm some currency, and hopefully the next time I see you, you'll be a much richer version of yourself.